All right, welcome, welcome to Next Step Bible Church. I am so excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We have a few announcements. One is Heartline this Thursday at 7 at Pastor Danny and Suzanne's. If you need the address, get with Suzanne and she will give it to you. Our boxes, my left, your right. Um, our praise and prayer box is the first one. And then our tithes, offerings, and donations box. We do not pass that around. We just want you to be led by the Holy Spirit. I have another exciting announcement. Next Sunday is Next at Bible Church's first year anniversary. Yes, hallelujah. It has gone by so fast, so please come join us. We're going to have some sweet treats and just come ready to party. <laughs> you might be wondering who is standing behind me. This is Dwayne. He is leading worship tonight. He flew to be with us from South Carolina. Him and Pastor Danny went to high school together about 50 years ago or something. <laughs> <laughs> so we are so happy that he's here with us. Um, I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we are going to worship. So, dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I pray um, just that you cover Dwayne during worship, Lord. I pray that you just just anoint this place, lift him up. I lift him up to you, Father. I pray uh, that you speak through Pastor Danny as he teaches us the word. I pray that all of us keep our eyes, ears, and just hearts focused on you. I thank you, Father, for everything that you're doing in this place, Lord, and everything that you're going to do. We love you and we praise you and we give you all the glory and honor, Lord. We just want more of you, Father. In Jesus' mighty, matchless name, amen. amen. Stand with us in worship. Come up to the front. You provide the fire And I'll provide the sacrifice You provide the spirit yeah. And I will open up inside Inside and Fill me up, God Fill me up God, fill me up, fill me up, God, fill me up, God, fill me up, God, fill me up. You provide the fire. I'll provide the sacrifice You'll provide the spirit yeah. And I will open up inside Inside and Fill me up, God Fill me up, God Fill me up, God Fill me up Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Love of God. Know the flow. The permeate. Oh, my soul. Love of God. Over Permeate, oh my soul, sing love of God, overflow, permeate, oh my soul, love of God, overflow, permeate. Oh, my soul. Would you just close your eyes just, just for a few minutes tonight? And uh, I don't know if you've come here tonight and you're feeling empty. 
I, I've come out of a season where there's a lot that's just empty inside. And, um, and, I, and I figure out why a lot of us are empty because uh, it's not that we aren't filled, it's just we leak. And it's kind of it's, it's kind of a funny statement as well as a serious statement. But if you're here tonight and you feel like I've just been spent out, there's just not much left. Here's the cool thing about who God is: is He loves to fill us up when we come to Him and ask. So, would you just it, between you and God tonight? Would you just ask Him, God, what I need you to fill me up? So we're going to hit this one again, and uh, let's just see what the Lord does with us. Is that all right? You'll provide the fire, and I'll provide the sacrifice. You'll provide the spirit. Inside, inside, fill me up, God, fill me up, fill me up, God, fill me up, fill me up, God, fill me up, fill me up, fill me up, love. Of God, overflow, permeate, oh my soul, love of God, overflow, permeate, oh my soul, fill me up, God. Come on, sing. I ain't singing by myself tonight. Y'all sing. Here we go. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to do this no more. Just give God a hand tonight. Would you welcome him here? Would you say, God, thank you so much? Would you thank him in advance for what he's getting ready to do to all of us tonight? Because I believe that God is up to something amazing. And, and uh, as Danny and I were doing the little promo thing, and he says, what do you got planned? I said, I, I don't. And, um, and God hasn't given me a whole bunch. He gave me that song and then just go from there. So we're going to go from here. But what I absolutely believe, that God's presence is here. Here's the thing about it is, God's always present. But sometimes we aren't aware that he's here. And when we begin to worship, we begin to recognize that he's here. And so uh, let's, uh, let's do here on the worship. Is that all right? I know they're working on the screen stuff, but this one I think everybody kind of knows, and we'll just see what God's doing. Light of the world, he stepped down in the darkness, opened my eyes. Let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say. You're my king. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. The King of 
long days Oh, so highly exalted Glorious in heaven above Humbly you came To the earth you created All full of safety So here I am to worship. There you go. You're all together. about worship and I said I, I just have this I just I almost want to invite you into my living room and my living room is real small I live in an RV it's a fifth wheel it's my it's really small I, I do have the slide out so I got some room and um, so I just get out my guitar and I just begin to worship and um, and he is just faithful to show up I don't think there's ever been a time that I've Gotten out my guitar, began to worship, and no matter what state I'm in, that he's just like, yeah, no, I'm not going to be there for you, Dwayne. There's never been a time. Now, there's been plenty of times I didn't feel it. And I didn't feel God's presence, but he's always, always been there. And um, so I, I'm going to, this is a song I wrote a while back, and um, and obviously you're not going to know it, but there'll be a point what you'll you'll kind of pick up on it. But I just want you to... Uh, and it's linger if you if if it's working up there. You got it. Thank you, sir. Um, and it's really just spending time in God's presence and what happens. And so, I encourage you, look at it. Let God speak to you however He wants to it, and let's see what what He continues to do tonight. Is that all right? Cool. In the shadow 
Somehow I have seen Somehow linger In the palm of your hands Somehow I'm feeling better Somehow I can't stay So I linger till all hell breaks loose. Ooh, yes, I will linger till all I see is you. So I linger as long as it takes. Oh God, I need you. How my heart hurts. So I linger till all hell breaks loose. Oh yes, I need. All I see is you. Who yes, I will linger till all hell breaks loose. Who yes, I will linger till all I see is you. So I will run. To you, yes, I will run to you, yes, I will run to you, yes, I will run to you, Lord, I will run to you. Jesus, I'll run, I'll run to you, Lord, I will run to you, Jesus, I'll run, I'll run to you, so I will linger as long as it takes. Is here in your presence is where I will stay. Sing that verse again. So I will linger as long as it takes. Is here in your presence. Is where I will stay, and Lord, I will run to you. Lord, I will run to you. Sing, Lord, I will run. A little out of sync. Lord, I will run. Yes, I will run. I'll run to you, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And I will lean here. Listen, Lord, I will linger here with you when there's nothing 
I can do. There's no else but you. And I'll stay right here with you. So I'll stay here with you. There's no other name like yours. There's no other name like yours. There's no other name like yours. There's no other name. No name like yours. The name of Jesus. Such a sweet moment. Wow. God, you're so good. Would you just thank him? Would you just say the name of Jesus? Mm. If you put speak to me up there, that'll be great. you do something just I'm gonna ask you if you feel it's good then you do that and if not you just you just do whatever you need to do but for a moment just find a place to sit down is there anybody here that needs a word from the Lord tonight okay it's just two of us cool Three, four, okay. All right. No, I believe you're absolutely going to get it. Get a good word tonight. But sometimes you need a personal word. And so this, this kind of worship song came, came out of uh, just a moment that I just... Uh, sort of a desperate, desperate place in my life for the Lord that I needed to hear from Him. And so... As we kind of worship through this song and you kind of hear it for the first time and as it, as God begins to speak to you, then however your response is, you just respond. Some of you might be, you just want to come up here and kneel for this altar and some may just want to just remain, sit, just sit down where you're at or you may get on your knees, you may want to raise your hands, you may want to walk around, I don't know what it is. But I believe that everyone here, that the Lord wants to speak a special word to you tonight. And we worship what happens in worship. And I'm sure you all know the story when David would go in and he'd sing before Saul, all the demons, everything that tormented Saul would leave. They would simply just, because they can't stand it. They can't stand worship. They can't stand when the name of Jesus is raised up. They can't stay it. And they go, and that is the things that torment you and I. It may not be demonic. It may be. But the things that torment us, both life situations and the, the things we go through and the things we can't control and things we want to control but we can't, when we begin to worship, all that goes away. The deepest fears that you have, the darkest fears that you have, the worst of the worst that you've been through, that goes away and it gives the opportunity for the Lord to speak to you and have a word for you so I'm going to shut up so the Lord can have that word the 
And all I want And all I need is A glimpse of you The bread of life You're the The cup I drink from my Worship you So won't you show me yeah. Won't you speak to me And whisper the words of life This heart longs to hear And all I want is, and all I need is a glimpse of you. The one I serve, your God, the God I love, I, I worship you. So won't you show me, yeah. oh, won't you speak to me and whisper the words of life this heart longs to hear? So won't you show me? Oh, won't you speak to me and whisper the words of life this heart longs to hear? Cause I won't hear you speak. I want to hear you speak. So softly, tenderly speak to me. So softly, tenderly speak to me. So softly, tenderly. So won't you show me Oh, won't you speak to me And whisper the words of life This heart longs to hear Let's give the Lord an applause.
Mm. You guys feel the Holy Spirit in this room? Oh, I feel it flowing. Hallelujah. There's just something cool about Dwayne being here. I, I, I played on multiple worship and wor multiple worship bands with Dwayne, me on drums, and uh, man, we've got some great memories, good times, and uh, I'm sure glad he's here. There's a, I always feel like I'm at home here at Next Step, but today I feel a little extra at home having somebody I went to high school with. We grew up together. We've done a lot of life together. And uh, hallelujah. Amen. I hope you feel it too. Amen. Yeah. Thanks. Woo. Welcome to Next Step Bible Church. How's everybody doing? Oh, that was some good worship. That was some good worship. You know, there's, there's a difference between just doing worship and being led in worship. And Dwayne definitely leads very well. And uh, I'm, my heart is full and I haven't gotten into the message. Amen. That's when you know it's going to be good. Well, we're continuing our series in Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 4, 17. This is uh, series number 8. <laughs> I don't know when we'll end. This will be the end of uh, chapter 4 today. We still have two chapters, 5 and 6, uh, to cover. So maybe by Christmas we'll be done with Ephesians. But... Yeah. It's just so, so full of stuff. I'm not going to rush it. So anyway, today's message is called Old Man versus New Man. Hallelujah. Yeah, Paul's into it. Man. It's going to be good. So uh, I'm going to open this up in prayer, and we're going to get into it. So Lord, Father, God, we feel your presence already. Hallelujah, you are worthy. Lord, I pray that you just prepare all of our hearts as you bring this word, you speak through me, Father God. May I decrease as you increase in me and through me, Father God. Lord, we give this time to you. This is all for your glory. All for your glory. So, Lord, may I just get out of the way and let you take over. This is your church. Hallelujah. So we pray all this in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. All right. There was a poll given. Ask them, people, what is the one thing about your life, if you could change, what would it be? The number one answer, and there wasn't even a close second, was physical appearance. If they could change one thing, it would be physical appearance. Many people mention their weight, others their height. Body type was high on the list. Hair color was another. It all had to do with the outer appearance. Not one person said character, motivation, confidence, or a pure heart. It was all external attributes. Early in the se series, we looked at Paul's teaching on the importance of the inner man. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that Paul's writings have a method and a theme. He always begins with doctrine and then follows it up with application. Well, in Ephesians 3, 14 through 16, don't turn there, I just have it written down. I want to mention this. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, through his spirit in the inner man. We should be focused way more on the inner man than the outer man. Amen. That poll shows us uh, just how lost we are as a society. I mean, every, everything, every advertisement, TV show, movie, man, it just puts a spotlight on outer appearance. Name brands, materialism, all that kind of stuff. Paul says, no, let's focus on the inner man, not the outer man. Back in chapter 3, Paul lays out the doctrine for strengthening your inner man. He tells us about our need to change and how to change and what God has to say about the importance of that change. Here in chapter 4, Paul gives us the application of what that looks like. Chapters 1 through 3 is doctrine. Chapters 4 through 6 
is application. So let's read the text. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God and the true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Well, there's a lot going on there. A lot going on there. Verses 17 to 32 are action-packed and loaded with commands and assignments. The first 16 verses of chapter 4 are a transition from chapters 1 and three, one through 3. Chapters 1 through 3 are full of doctrine. Chapter 4 through 6, like I said, is application. And in verses 17 through 32, which we're going through today that we just read, Paul lays down demands and commands of what the Christian life looks like. I'm reading a book right now, and uh, there's a a part where they're, they're talking about Ephesians. And there's a guy named Pastor Max Dunham. And he said this, and I quote, I had to write this down. It was good. Watch this. He's talking about Ephesians right where we're at, right here. We must not overlook the first three chapters of Ephesians, says Pastor Max. If we do, we may see the Christian faith as a nag or a fuss and a whine. A lot of rules and regulations, should do's and ought to's, but very little joy. Mm. Likewise, though, to take only chapters 1 through 3 without the practical demands of chapters 4 through 6 may tempt us to cheap grace, soft religion without any muscle of responsibility and demand for moral conduct and commitment. To righteousness. Ooh. The living and doing are present here in Ephesians. I'll read that again. The living and doing are present here in Ephesians. It has the invitation and the imperative. Paul says, you are a child of God. Now become a child of God. Grow as a child of God. Act like a child of God. You are a new person in Christ. Grow up into that person. Faith and response go together. Mm. I, I read that and I said, Woo, boy, <laughs> I like this guy. I've never met him. 
I've got to, I've got to quote him. Paul uses the word, the word walk six times in this epistle. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, you begin a walk with Jesus. A walk means there's movements, there's next steps. Paul shows us the importance of our walk, our journey with Christ. Watch this. If you aren't walking in Christ, you aren't growing in Christ. If you aren't growing in Christ, you are lukewarm. I'll say that again. If you aren't walking in Christ, you aren't growing in Christ. Because see, if you're not walking, you're stagnant. You're still. There's no movement. So if you're not walking in Christ, you're not growing in Christ. If you're not growing in Christ, you are lukewarm. And we know what God thinks about lukewarm folks. He's not a fan. So let's begin peeling the onion, as I like to say. Let's start in the beginning with verse 17 here in chapter 4. So 17 and 19 are all one sentence. Therefore, it's all connected. It's one thought. So I will read 17, 18, and 19 together, and then we'll go back and unpack it. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Okay, back at 17, says that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Paul mentions a separation here. There's a separation going on. He's saying those, who, uh, those of you who have committed your lives to Christ are separated and set apart from the others. There's a separation there. As Christians and believers, we're set apart in this world. We're to be aliens to this world. We're not to love the things of this world. That's what the world does. That's what Paul's trying to get across here. Don't turn there, but just as a reference, I love doing cross-references and examples elsewhere in the Bible to back all this up. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, if you want to jot that down for future reference. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17 says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I can just stop right there. I can just stop right there. Oh, but he keeps going. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? You see what's going on here? And what accord has Christ with Belial? I did it. Or what part has a believer with the unbeliever? Kind of an inside joke. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And as God said, these are in quotes, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Mm. We're, we're not, so we're, we're, we're just, how do I say this? We're supposed to go after the lost, obviously, that's the Great Commission. But we journey and do life together as a body of Christ with fellow believers, with the like minded. That's important. I love the, the, I've said this before, I'll say it again. We got a handful of new people here. The, the, the juicy grilled steak analogy. You got this grill out and, and you're, you're grilling this juicy steak and it's just picture perfect. And if you're a Christian, you're going to eat it, you know, probably a medium rare or medium, just so you know. So you know. And so <laughs> that's got to be a scripture somewhere. So this steak is looking delicious. You don't take an old dirty plate that's a week old with old food on it, old junk on it, with a little bit of mold on it, and put that juicy steak on that plate. It's dirty. It's unworthy of that steak. No, you get a nice clean plate that's worthy of such a juicy, awesome meal of a steak. You don't put a juicy steak on a, on a dirty plate. It's the same way with us. 
We're Christians. We've been redeemed. We've been sanctified. We're clean. We're, we, we don't go and, and hang out on a dirty plate. In other words, dirty friends, uh, partying friends, uh, worldly friends. We just don't do that. Because here's what happens. The, 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 the steak, even though it's juicy and awesome, you put it on a dirty, moldy plate. Guess what happens to that steak? It becomes dirty. It becomes nasty. That plate doesn't become better. See what I'm saying? That plate corrupts the steak. So we have to be wise. We have to be smart. Mm. It's important who we hang out with. It's important who we do life with. Amen? So far off my notes. I'm just walking in the spirit tonight. Mm. Dwayne's got me all fired up. Verse 17 says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Watch this. In the futility of... Or another word for futility is uselessness of their mind. <laughs> so the lost Gentiles were futile minded. Paul is telling them as new Christians that they must become kingdom minded. In the futile mind, there is no power, no hope, and there's no direction. On the other hand, a kingdom-minded person has power, has hope, and has a whole lot of direction. Amen. Through the commands and assignments that's given to us through God's Word. That's why it's so important to be in God's Word. People say, Pastor Dan, I don't understand how you hear from the Lord so much. I, I want to hear from the Lord. Here's where you start, right here. Here's where you start. It's like, it's next steps. It's baby steps. You get in his word and, you, and he'll start telling you what to do. You'll start getting used to his voice. And guess what? Then when he does speak to you, when he guides you, you're like, you know what? I've heard that before. That sounds familiar. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. And then you're kind of off the milk. You're on the meat now. Now you're just hanging out with God in the car. God, what am I doing? What do you have for me? And he'll tell you, do this, do that. Turn here. But I wanted to, nope, turn here. Yes, Lord. And you go, boom. There's some elderly lady with a flat tire inside the road. If you turn right, you'd have, a you'd have missed a blessing. You'd have missed an opportunity to serve. Mm, man, talk to God. Learn your shepherd's voice. Man, he'll guide you. Oh, it's a, I, I hear testimonies all the time. I love it. I love testimonies. I have testimonies of hearing from the Lord. Getting back on track. Verse 18 says, Having their understanding darkened. Hmm. This means their understanding or view and perspective of things are corrupted, tainted, and perverted. They're clouded. Having their understanding darkened. 1 John 1, 7 tells us to walk in the light as he is in the light. Light is the opposite of darkness. You ever notice how most crimes happen at night, not during the day? Hmm. Unless you live in Chicago, it's just 24-7. <laughs> but normally, it's at night. Mom used to tell me, be home before midnight because nothing good ever happens after midnight. And I lived in a farm town. Another thing, Paul says, having their understanding darkened, that word darkened I have highlighted, when it's dark outside, visibility is at a minimum. I'm going somewhere with this. The enemy doesn't want us to have clarity. Satan brings confusion through darkness. <laughs> I'm just going on bunny trails left and right. Sorry, not sorry. I guess it's going to be that kind of night. I remember one time uh, when I was a uh, professional drummer and, and playing out pretty much every weekend, uh, we had this gig way out in the boonies. And we got finished with the gig about 1 o'clock in the morning. By the time we got tor everything torn down, I was still uh, close enough to get back home. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm driving home. It's pitch black. And I'm on this country road. I mean, no street lights, no nothing. And I, I wanted uh, to text and, and say I was on my way home. So I pulled over to the side of the street out in the middle of nowhere. And, and I d sent my text. And I looked up. And I said, you know what? I'm going to turn my headlights off just to see how dark this place really is. I turned it off, and it was pitch black. I mean, <laughs> just black, black. Just no lights anywhere. I don't think I've ever been in that kind of darkness. And when I was reading this, having their understanding darkened, I thought, wow, I remember sitting in the cab of that truck, 
And as long as there was light, I could see things. I could see trees. I could see deer and stuff and whatever. I could just see. But as soon as I turned those lights off, it just went pitch black. I had no clarity, no vision. I, I couldn't see anything. And I'm like, wow, that's what it's like when you're lost. And then the Lord gave me this song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Oh, come on. It's like we're blind, we're in that darkness, and you pray to the Lord, Lord, enter my life. Boom, the headlights come on, and you can see things now. Oh, come on. Oh, I know I could pass the mic and hear some testimonies in this room. Hallelujah. Mm. All right, verse 18 continued. I'm fired up. Having their understanding darkened, watch this, being alienated from the life of God. I have the life underlined. If Satan can pervert and corrupt our thoughts, it alienates us or distances us away from the life of God. Oh, oh come on. How many people here have been walking with the Lord and you have this stumble in life, you, uh, things get crazy, things go off the rails, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in the darkness again. You were in the light, but now you're off the rails, the, 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 the high beams on your, your headlights of your spiritual vehicles off, and you can't see anything. Nothing makes sense at that time in your life. I think all of us have been there. The life of God means living kingdom-minded it means having the love of God, the mind of God, the actions of God, the life of God. Mm. I'll read verse 18 again and keep hitting the different parts of it that are important. Having their understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God, watch us, because of the ignorance that is in them. Mm. You know the definition of ignorance is? I used to think ignorance was just you're stupid. No, not at all. It's the lack of knowledge. You don't know what you don't know. You just don't. And one of my favorite verses, I say it all the time, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. That's ignorance. And it says it right here. Because of the ignorance that is in them, the lack of knowledge. Why do we lack knowledge? And it goes on at 18, says, because of the blindness of their heart. Mm, there's that darkness again. You can't see a theme here with the blindness, the darkness, can't see, no clarity. Mm. Enemies is having a heyday here in this part. And Paul's warning everybody about the enemy. There are five key words and phrases in verse 19 I want to look at. So we're moving on to 19. I'm going to read it out loud. Who, being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Whew, there's a lot going on there. So you know what? I'm just going to have to unpack this word by word or keyword or key phrase at a time. First one is past feeling. Who being past feeling? I'm like, all right, Lord, what do you mean by that? Lord says it means being heartless or apathetic or watch this, desensitized. Mm. We do, we do a wrong thing enough times. We, at first, it convicts us. We're embarrassed by it. We're ashamed by it. But you know what? We do it enough, and, and many, many times we become desensitized to it. It doesn't really affect us. That's when you're in trouble. When you can commit sin and it doesn't phase you, you're in trouble. You're in big-time trouble. That's what's happened to our society. Huh. 20 years ago, uh, they hid sin in a closet. They were ashamed of it. They were embarrassed of it. Now, no, they celebrate and throw parades for it because they, the society has become desensitized to it. And I said, when that happens, you're in trouble. Our country's in trouble. Oh, it's in big trouble. That's why we need to be bold and stand on the truth of God and, not, and, and never uh, waver from that. Never be distracted from that. Never become desensitized. That man... <laughs> Every commercial now, every movie has a woke agenda. <laughs> and I just watch it. I said, well, watch. All they're doing is desensitizing people and desensitizing. And these kids that are in it now, by the time they become adults, that's all they've known. Right. So now they're just, it, it, you're weird if you don't uh, have tolerance. You're just weird. You're full of hate. Paul, how dare you? Mm. 
It's getting worse and worse and worse. Man, they have an evil agenda. All right. So that's the past feeling. The other key uh, phrase I saw is given themselves. Who being past feeling have given themselves, not taken, but given themselves. (laughs) They weren't kidnapped. They weren't hijacked. They gave themselves. They surrendered to sin. They've given themselves over to it. I mentioned the movie Nefarious quite a bit because it's a, it's a movie that's spot on spiritually. It talks about demons and, and the, the spiritual realm and the, the spiritual warfare that's going on around us. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's out now. You can rent it. You can buy it, whatever. But go see it. But there's, there's a scene in the movie uh, where Nefarious, the demon, is talking to this psychologist or psychiatrist, whatever. And he says, demons are given access through a series of yeses. Oh, boy, that hit me. Pause. <laughs> demons are given access through a series of yeses. See what they do is they tempt you. And, and it's a numbers game. It's like if you're in sales, you know, you call 100 people, you may get three sales. You know, that's awesome. You, you call 1,000 people in a day, you know, do the numbers. So what demons do, is they, they come up to, remember, demons can never make you sin. They can only tempt you. Right. It's up to you to take the bait. So they'll tempt you with something. You go, no. They'll tempt you with something else. No. They'll tempt you with something else. You go, hmm, huh, I'll take a look at that. Oh, all right. We got them. We got one, yes. And then they go on. It starts when you're younger. And by the time you're a teenager, you've given them enough yeses. Now you have a stronghold. You have an addiction. You have whatever. You've given them a legal right to you. Demons are given access through a series of yeses. But what does Scripture say about that? Scripture warns us about this. Resist the devil and he will flee. If you say no every time, he's not going to waste his time with you. He's going to go somewhere else where he can get a bunch more sales. (laughs) He's on commission. He's not going to waste his time with you. (laughs) This guy's bullheaded. Man, (laughs) he says no all the time. Resist the devil and he will flee. Say yes to the devil and he will take up residence. I have a new home. Mm, I see it all the time. Okay, given themselves. These people Paul are talking about have given themselves over to it. They've said enough yeses. They're like, you know what? We're just going to waller in the sin. The next one, uh, key phrase in this verse, 19, is over to lewdness. It says they've given themselves over to lewdness. Lewdness is indecency. It's vulgarity. It's the obscene. So they've given themselves over that. Oh, Satan loves that. Oh, Satan loves that. The next key word I have is uncleanness. It says they've given themselves over to the lewdness to work all uncleanness. That's sinfulness. That's unrighteousness, which leads us right into the next key word with greediness. That's absolute selfishness. That's pride. That's ego. Always say ego, E-G-O, edges God out. That's the greediness right there. So (laughs) chapter 19 is just packed full of cool stuff, stuff we can learn from. Moving on to verse 20. It says, but you have not so learned Christ. But you have not so learned Christ. Paul is saying, if you are still doing all this bad stuff, then you haven't learned. You do not understand God's economy and God's ways. But you have not so learned Christ. Verse 20 here is a pivot point in this lesson. It's a pivot point. It says, this is your old life over here walking in sin. And this is your new life over here walking in righteousness. This is separating things. Verse 21 says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. I love how it says, if indeed you have heard him. In other words, if you're going to claim to be a believer, if you're going around telling everybody you're a Christian, if you're actually going to walk the walk in truth, are you? And that leads right into 22. Watch. Watch that you put off 
concerning your former conduct. That's your drinking, your drug, and your, your promiscuity, whatever it is. Since so that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows. Grows means it's a, a continual, continual decline. And I say decline because the next word is corrupt. Which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Paul's saying, if you're going to make this commitment, then this is what it's going to look like. And he talks about that in the next verse in 23. And be renewed. There's the new man. Remember this message is called the old man versus the new man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Three key words that jump out right here. Renewed, spirit, and mind. Uh, guess what that is? That's your inner man. Doesn't talk about anything about the exterior. That's all your inner man. Boy, Paul's just, his writing is genius. I told you uh, uh, last week or a week or two ago, when I read Paul, I'll be reading. I'm like, wait a minute. He says something over here about this and I'll have to go back. And I'm like, here it is. That's right. It's all tied together. And then I'll read further and further and I'll read something else. Like, wait a minute. He said this over here and it's all connected. I love Paul's writings. You know, because it's not Paul, it's God writing through Paul. I don't care how smart and genius Paul was. He's not this smart. Be renewed in spirit of your mind. This is the inner man that he talked about earlier. It doesn't mention anything about the exterior. So why do we as a culture hyper-focus on the exterior? That's exactly what the Lord wants us, I mean the world wants us to do. Because you know, you know why? Because it distracts us. It takes up the time we should be working on the inner man. And we're so focused on plastic surgery and hair weaves and breast implants and lip injections. And it goes on and on. And I can't even watch shows that are filmed in Hollywood and California because they look so fake. I just see the spirits all over them. And I don't mean judge, be judgmental. I can just see it these days. It's sickening. Everybody's so focused on the outer, outer. And why be beautiful on the exterior when you're horribly ugly and nasty on the inside? Oh, it's horrible. Mm. Watch this. It doesn't mention anything about our exterior, so why do we, as a culture, hyper-focus on the exterior? Watch this. Because that's the natural. The supernatural, the Holy Spirit, dwells on the interior. The world is out there, and the kingdom is in here. Amen? kingdom is in here that's where the holy spirit resides internally that's why we work on the inner man oh it all makes sense moving on to 24 it says and you put on the new man which was created according to god oh that's so good in true righteousness and holiness um there's a lot of false righteousness going on out there there's a lot of false righteousness going on. You test the spirits. You have to use discernment because, oh boy, they make it sound good. <laughs> They're slick. The kingdom is on the inside. When we put on the new man, which was created according to God, it's true righteousness and holiness. Have you put on the new man? Have you put on the new man? This is your next step moment. Maybe if you're honest with yourself, you can still see some of the old man in certain areas of your life. Maybe you're mostly new man, but there's, some, there's still some baggage that you're toting along with you into this new life. You know what it's time to do? It's time to take that baggage over to the cross, lay it at the foot of the cross, and leave it. Leave that old man back there and step into the new man. Come on. Mm. Some of you in here have next steps, and God's making it very clear. There are certain places in your life you need to separate from. Work on that. Put on the new man in those areas that don't represent the kingdom. And let me tell you, you know what that is. It's not like it's a mystery. We know. You know ourselves. You look in the mirror, you know. 
Maybe nobody else around you knows, but you know, and God knows. It's one of those moments where you're like, Lord, I'm holding on to some stuff that I need to let go of. Lord, I repent. That's the first step. Second step, Lord, help me, because sometimes it's too big for you, and you need God. Most of the time, if not every time, you're going to need God. Help me, Lord. He loves that. That's surrender. That's like, you know what? I give up trying under my own strength, under my own uh, intellect, my own whatever. I, I give it to you. This is just too big for me. He loves that posture of humility and surrender. Oh, man, that cranks his motor. Verse 24 separates the wheat from the tares. It separates the wannabes from the real deal believers. Hmm. Old man versus new man. You can only put on the new man when the old man dies. That's right. That's right. You can only put on the new man when the old man dies. You can't walk in both. They cannot cohabitate. That's like that juicy steak on a dirty plate. You can't do it. See, the old man was full of sin. The new man has been redeemed. The old man was so full of lust, the new man has pure thoughts. The old man was dishonest. The new man is honest. The old man always had an angle or an agenda. The new man has pure motives and zero agenda. The old man didn't care about church. The new man loves church, serves at church, financially blesses the church. The old man lived for self. The new man dies to self. The old man was concerned with what the world loved. The new man is only concerned with what God loves. Ooh. The old man's citizenship was the world. The new man's citizenship is paradise. It's heaven. Amen? Amen. Oh, there's a big difference between the old man and the new man. When we get saved, we die to ourselves. We, we, we get rid of that old self. It's just junk. It's dirty. It's filthy. Cleanse me, Lord. And he shows up and he forgives us of our sins. He cleanses us. And we step into this new man. Oh, it's glorious. As you guys know, I'm, I'm into cars. I love cars, especially classics. I love classics. Well, I was watching a video a while back. There's this YouTube channel that I'm a part of where they fix up cars and restore cars. And, and it just... I'm not mechanical, so it just <laughs> it amazes me, the talent these guys have. Well, what, what caught my attention is I'm a fan of Pontiac Firebirds and Pontiac Trans Ams. And they had a 1972 Pontiac Firebird, and it was a hoopty. <laughs> they said, we're going to take this car, and we're going to do a frame-off restoration. I said, you have my attention. And it was like 10 videos. Like it wasn't one video. It was like this whole series. That's so whenever I'd get free time, I'd, I'd put the headphones on and I'd watch it. Oh man, they took this car completely apart. I'm talking every panel, every nut and bolt, the engine. It just ate. It was like they had this huge warehouse is what they do. And they had thousands of pieces. It was all organized and numbered on the floor of this humongous, looked like a, a, an aircraft hangar. And they started with the frame. They sandblasted the frame, got all the rust off of it, all the old junk off of it. They re-welded re some stuff. Man, they went through. They polished every nut and bolt. And if it was a bad nut or bolt, they replaced it. They rebuilt that whole car from the ground up. And it was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, by the time they got finished... They dropped a new hyped-up engine in it. Uh, they gave it a, a fancy new paint job. Uh, they, they had uh, sandblasted and re-chromed every emblem and replaced it. That beautiful car received the iconic Firebird on that hood. It just makes the car. Oh, custom airbrush, custom painted, gorgeous. Oh, it was glorious. When they finished, it was an absolute work of art. But here's the deal, though. If you looked at the original owner's manual in the glove box, it said 1972 Pontiac 
Firebird. But in reality, it was a brand new car. It was a new man. That car no longer runs how it used to run. It no longer operates the way it used to operate. It doesn't even look how it used to look. See where I'm going with this? It's got better traction with the new wheels than the old ones. It's been made new. Have you been made new? Mm. When you get saved, you're a frame off restoration. The Lord comes in through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and completely rebuilds you and, and gives you a new paint job, a new motor, a, a new interior, just uh, all the junk that you had. He gets rid of it. Everything's new now. You're a new man. You should run better. You should think better. You should operate better because you're a new man. The old man was so full of junk and sin and worldliness, you just <laughs> tripping through life, just freaking out trying to get through life. Over here, not that it's easy, but let me tell you, when you have God on your side, oh, it's going to be awesome because you have his protection. You have his guidance. Before then, you were just flying blind. That, that car didn't have headlights at all. Just drove around in the dark. This one here has high beams with a light bar across the top. That 72 Pontiac Firebird was made new. Have you been made new? All right, application. Paul gives us practical points here in verses 25 through 32. That's cool because Paul uh, is giving us application. So I'm just going to use his application as our application. He kind of makes it easy for me. All right. He's going to show us what a new man should look like. I have six points here. Point number one. The new man is truthful. The new man is truthful. In verse 25, it says, Therefore, putting away lying, <laughs> there's the truthfulness, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Uh, Paul isn't talking about your next door neighbor. He's talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we know that because of the rest of the verse says, for we are members of one another. Come on. Come on. He's talking about the body of Christ here. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. That part says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. I believe Paul's talking about accountability, edifying, encouraging other people. I also believe Paul's talking about being uh, truthful and honest and having good character and integrity. <laughs> Grandpa used to say, a man is only as good as his word. Anybody ever heard that one? Yeah. A man is only as good as his word. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. You can't say one thing and then do another. Why? Scripture tells us, I love Scripture. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. <laughs> so as believers, we should always be trustworthy. Always, always be dependable. We need to be honorable. Remember, Paul said, walk worthy of your calling. Oh, that's so important. The new man is truthful. Point number two. The new man knows the difference between righteous anger and worldly anger. Verses 26 and 27 go together. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, that's cool. The Bible just said to be angry, <laughs> but do not sin. We're going to explain that in a minute. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Uh, I'm going to unpack verses 26 and 27. Anger is an emotion. Guess who created emotions? God. Many people think anger is evil. Can it be evil? I mean, yes, it can be. Can Satan use it? Yeah, sure can. But evil is an emotion. I mean, anger is an emotion, not evil. Whew. It can be evil, but there is good anger, and it's called righteous anger. Let me explain the difference. Watch this. Oh, man, I was at my desk and God gave me this. I'm like, oh, this is so you, God. I am not this smart. Watch this. The root of worldly anger is pride, bitterness, jealousy, 
insecurity, and so on. The root of worldly anger. Now, the root of righteous anger can be injustice, corruption, unfairness, untruth, unethical behavior, and so on. That's righteous anger. Watch this. Worldly anger is laced with satanic emotions. Righteous anger is grounded in kingdom emotions. Oh, there's a bumper sticker. I'm going to say that again just because I want to hear it. Worldly anger is laced with satanic emotions. Righteous anger is grounded in kingdom emotions. Ooh, that was so anointed. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus exhibited righteous anger in the temple when he flipped tables and ran everybody out with a whip. I love that story. Nobody likes to talk about that Jesus. I do. I have a testimony here. <laughs> we, we had a small group we met in our house for years. And uh, one of the guys in the small group, man, he's chasing after the Lord. He called me one night just way upset. He goes, man, <laughs> he goes, I'm calling you from my, my master bedroom closet. <laughs> what? He goes, yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> and he didn't want his wife or the kids to hear. <laughs> And, I, and he was hiding from everybody. I'm like, huh, well, you got me worried. What's going on? He goes, man, let me tell you. He got his neighbor, right? He's out there detailing his car. He's got the car and, and everything open. And my, my two daughters are out in the driveway riding. The, the, one of them has a big wheel. One of them has a, uh, uh, their, their little bicycle with, with, with the training wheels on it. He said, but that guy's got the most filthy rap music with swear words and just vulgarity blasting. Around my daughters. And I'm, I'm so angry. I'm upset. I'm calling you uh, for accountability because I, I feel so sinful. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out, bro. You're not sinning at all. This is a long pause. Huh? You're not sinning at all. I said, that's called righteous anger. Explain. I said, look, man. You're the protector of your family. You're the protector of your daughters. I said, Jesus got mad and flipped tables in the, in the temple and ran people out with a whip. Jesus did that. Bro, that's all I need to hear. Click. <laughs> it disappeared. I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> so a little bit later, I'm like, man, I better call him and check on him, make sure he's not in jail. <laughs> so I call him back, and he's all in such a good mood. He goes, man, let me tell you what happened. He goes, I went over there, <laughs> and he said, I kind of puffed my chest out. I said, hey, man, I need to have a word. And the guy turns the radio off, so what's that? And he said he was like 19 years old. He's a teenager. He said, yeah. He said, look, man, see these two little girls out here playing? He goes, yeah. He goes, man, you got the most vulgar uh, music playing. I don't want my daughters exposed to that. He said, the guy was like, you could tell the guy didn't know any better because he wasn't a parent. And he looked at the little girls and said, oh, my bad. I'm so sorry. He said, I, I won't play the music anymore. I, I didn't even think of that. He said, the guy was nice as he could be and turned it off. And he goes, wow, I didn't have to beat him up. <laughs> like, well, praise the Lord. And he said, man, we ended up talking with her and okay. I just want my, my daughters to be out here and be able to ride their bicycles. I said, bro, that is righteous anger. Protect your girls. Protect your family. Sometimes we're allowed to get angry. Amen? I love that testimony. <laughs> it's like, as soon as I told him, he goes, got to go. Click. <laughs> like, out the door. He just needed permission. It was awesome. He never thought of that, though. He just thought this anger was, was sin. I'm angry at my neighbor. I'm, I'm full of sin. I need to repent. I need to get my mind right. No, you don't. Boy, you needed to hear that. Somebody out here maybe needed to hear that. Protect your family. Protect your wife. Protect your kids. Mm, this is a crazy world we live in. There's righteous anger. All right. Point number three. The new man has good work ethic. Yes. <laughs> the new man has good work ethic. Verse 28, watch this. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who, is, who has need. First thing that jumped out at me was let him who steal steal no longer. I told you I'm reading this book. It's the same book that I got this quote from the Dr. Max guy, whatever his name, Pastor Max, whatever it was. Um, hope I'm saying that right. Anyway, but it says, let him who stole steal no longer. In that book, it says there are, uh, no, let me say this first. There are no shortcuts in kingdom living. And then this part came from the book. 
For biblical accuracy, a lot of people Paul was addressing were from the lower parts of the Gentile society, such as slaves and those among slaves. Stealing was almost considered normal to them, and Paul was redirecting them towards righteousness and honest living. Mm, I found that. I love learning history like that. And that kind of goes along with what I said earlier about, you know, you do something long enough, you become desensitized to it. It said here that it almost became pretty much stealing was normal to them. It was just had become a way of life. 2 Corinthians 3.10 says, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. It's talking about good work ethic. All right, so 28 continued, says, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, what is good. All right, there's this awesome Christian movie out called Bruce Almighty. And it has a powerful scene where God, played by Morgan Freeman, tells Bruce Almighty, watch this, this is a great quote. People underestimate the benefit of good old manual labor. There's freedom in it. Some of the happiest people in the world go home smelling to high heaven at the end of the day. I thought, wow, i got to use that. That's good. That's good work ethic. Too many people in America mooch off the system. Unfortunately, too many Christians mooch off the church. I say bless the church. Don't always make the church bless you. Then it goes on to say that he may have something to give who has need. How are you going to bless someone if you're broke? The Bible tells us to bless others. How are you going to do that if if you're broke? And you can't bless on me because you're broke. You can't bless the church if you're mooching off the church. You can't bless your neighbor that's in need if your pockets are empty. Don't forget that job that you have isn't your job. It's God's job that he allows you to work at. Mm. It's not your money you make. It's God's money that he allows you to have and steward. That's why it's so important for us to be good stewards of all that stuff. That helps keep it all in perspective. Watch this. Renew your minds in this area of finances. It may be part of your new man that you haven't embraced yet. I was listening uh, to a Christian guy who was a motivational speaker and uh, loved listening to him. He, he had all this motivational stuff about work, work ethic, uh, do the things today that others won't do, so you'll have the things tomorrow that others won't have. But then he always backed it up with Scripture. And that's why I liked him. Like, okay, it wasn't just psychobabble. He just backed it up with, with Scripture. And I'm like, I just like this guy a lot. And, um, man, he was so about what Suzanne says, you give God legs. Give God legs. Um, it, it's so, you, you can't just, uh, just, I like to say, you can't just lean on a shoulder and pray for God to give you a hole. (laughs) You start digging, and then God will bless you as you dig that hole. Well, he used to say, hey, his thing was, he grew up uh, in the ghetto, and he was very, very poor, and he made a promise. He said, man, one day I'm going to work so hard and be so successful. First of all, I'm buying my mom a house so she don't have to work no more because she worked like two or three jobs all the time, and one of the the jobs she was a maid and cleaned these rich people's houses, and they just he just... He would ride with her to the house someday and said, Mom, you're going to live in a house like this one day. And she was like, Oh, you're such a dreamer. He goes, No, I promise you. He made it happen, by the way. But here's the thing. He said, I have a heart for blessing people, for giving things to people, uh, for financially just, just blowing people's minds. He goes, The problem was I was always broken. I could never do that. But I wanted to do it so bad. So he prayed to the Lord. said, Lord, please make me successful. And he went on to be like a, a popular, very popular uh, radio disc jockey. This is back in the 70s. Um, then he went on to, he had uh, a talk show on television and all this kind of stuff. And he, he came into money. And first thing he did, he, he, he held up his bargain. He went back to his hometown in the ghetto and built a huge baseball field. Because all the kids loved to play baseball, but they would play in the streets. Because they didn't have a place to play. He built a brand new <laughs> little league size baseball stadium thing for him. Another thing he built was a basketball gym, basically a whole recreation center. He kept pouring his money back into the community. He said, Lord, the more money you give me, the more I'm just going to shovel it out. God's like, I can use somebody like that. 
It blessed his community. He, he was able to minister to all these kids that, that didn't have dads. And he created these programs where they have boxing lessons for free. He would fund it. And these kids would show up. He got them off the streets. Man, what a story. What a story. And I thought, this right here, man, you got to have good work ethic. How are you going to bless somebody if you're broke? Make that your prayer. Make that your prayer. That might be part of the new man that you step into tonight. Point number four. <laughs> the new man controls his tongue. Oh, I love this one. This might get me in trouble. <laughs> the new man controls his tongue. Verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. I wish I could tattoo this on some people's foreheads. I'll tell you what. Can I tattoo this on your forehead? You need it. Man, when I'm counseling people and mentoring people, oh boy. Most people speak before they think. They argue before they discern. Hmm. We have this toothpaste analogy we like to do in marriage class where we take a plate take a tube of toothpaste. Up. We've done it here before. We squirt the toothpaste out on the plate and we say, anybody want to volunteer to come put this toothpaste back in the tube? We haven't had a volunteer yet because it's impossible. It's the same way with our words. Once you speak a word, it's out there. You can never put it back. You can apologize. You can buy flowers. You can, you can do all kinds of stuff. But you, those words are always out there. You can't get them back into that tube. So many times when we speak, it's an instant reaction to somebody or something. Too many people lack kingdom filters <laughs> and spew filth over the very people they love the most. I love that kingdom filter part. The power of life and death are in the tongue. You know that, right? We, we, read, we read, learned about that in James. Yeah. Power of life and death are in the tongue. You either speak victory into someone or you speak defeat over them. One of the two. Are you edifying one another or are you speaking curses over one another? Ouch. It's just true. Paul's warning everybody right here. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Because mm, Paul knows the, the dangers of that. He knows the damage that that can cause. <laughs> but instead, what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Your spouse, your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ should always be lifted up, encouraged, and inspired by the words you have spoken to them. If your spouse, your loved one, your kids, your brothers and sisters in Christ ever walk away discouraged, sad, tearful, and upset, you have failed at this kingdom command that Paul is teaching all of us right here in verse 29. Control your temper, control your mouth. <laughs> I like to say, make sure your mouth is as saved as you claim to be. Ooh, let's make a shirt on that one. Make sure your mouth is as saved as you claim to be. Oh boy. The new man controls his tongue. Amen? Point number five. The new man honors the Holy Spirit. The new man honors the Holy Spirit. Oh, boy. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, when we sin, when we fall short, we grieve the Holy Spirit that resides inside of us, inside the inner man. It grieves him. Another way to put it is that we disappoint the Holy Spirit. We disappoint the Lord. Uh, that convicts me to the core. I want my Abba Father proud of me. Man, I used to be such a people pleaser now. I'm just a God pleaser. I just, whew, whatever I'm doing, is this glorifying the Lord? Is this, is this pleasing the Lord? Uh, am I getting a, a Holy Spirit high five? I just want to please the Lord. I mean, I still make plenty of mistakes. Don't amen, Suzanne. But still, 
We need to take our walk with Christ seriously. And I said before, Paul says, walk worthy of your calling. May our walks always be pleasing and honorable to the Lord. Dwayne, come on up. Point number six, the new man is loving. The new man is loving. I'm going to read uh, verses 31 and 32 together. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, by the way, clamor is loud chaos, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What's the first two words in verse 31? Let all. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say most. It says all. All means an all. That's all all means. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. See, verse 31 represents the world, the lost, and the hateful. Verse 32 represents the kingdom-minded, the body of Christ. Hmm. I love Paul's writings. These two passages in this text is an excellent illustration of old man versus new man. We have old man in 31 and a new man in 32. Hallelujah! Huh. Oh, this application is awesome. Do you see the key words in verse 31? I'll list them as you look. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, or chaos, and evil speaking. If you're wallowing in any of these, you're showing signs of the old man, your old self. The Lord is showing you your next steps. He is exposing things you should be working on. Hey, and we all have stuff to work on. We all have next steps. And in verse 32, it says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. See, the body of Christ is a family. We need to stick together. We need to journey together. We need to thrive together. Hallelujah. It's good stuff. We need to be speaking into each other and edifying each other, encouraging each other, praying over each other because that honors the Lord. That's the new man. Mm. So as the new man, let's love each other. Let's forgive each other as Paul teaches us in verse 32. And it says, as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Lord, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this message. We thank you for your living, infallible word. Oh, it's been so good. What a good, good service. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we put away the old man and put on the new man. Work on all of us in this room tonight and those watching online right now. Put a Holy Spirit spotlight in areas of our life that still have old man connections so we know to do business with it. Let's repent where we need to repent. Father God, I pray for healing and restoration in places that need to be healed and restored. Bring things back in line how you had it uh, to be from the get-go and that Satan is messed up and tarnished and scarred. We bind the enemy, we rebuke him, we cast him out into the abyss right now in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. We step boldly into the new man. Help us, Father God, to continue to work on our inner man. Lord, we love you. We love you. We want more of you. So continue to work on each one of us. Continue to shape each one of us. Continue to mold each one of us. Make your commands and assignments very clear to us so we can 
walk in victory and walk worthy in our calling and to please you. Huh. We want our daddy in heaven uh, pleased and happy. I don't ever want you disappointed in me or any of my friends, my family here. So help us, help us, Lord. Protect us, guide us, direct us. Make the light very bright in front of us. So as we take our next steps, we can plant our foot firmly and confidently on the foundation that you laid in front of us already. Guide our steps, Lord. We love you, Lord. We give this evening to you and the rest of this week. I just ask you to bless everyone in here and everyone watching online. Just bless them. May the Holy Spirit flow right now in Jesus' name through this room and through the cameras. May people sitting in their car watching or sitting in their living room feel a rush of the Holy Spirit just flow through their house right now in Jesus' name. Say, feel your presence. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you're omnipresent. You're such a big, big God. So I just speak blessings over everyone that's in earshot of this microphone that's up against my cheek, Lord. I pray for healings. I pray for restorations. I pray for people's finances. I pray for people's business ideas, business ventures. I pray for families. I pray for marriages right now in Jesus' name. Heal and restore in Jesus' mighty name. Put things back together that Satan has tried to rip apart as far as families and marriages, businesses, friendships, whatever it may be. I pray for restoration right now in Jesus' name. The name above every name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have power and authority over in the name of Jesus Christ. So I speak that over everyone right now in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for tonight. Thank you for Dwayne. Thank you for everyone here and everyone watching online, Lord. I thank you for every single one of them. Just continue to, to flow in us and through us. Let us be the light in this very dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're, you're uh, free to hang out and fellowship and whatever. And uh, we love you and hope to see you next time. God bless you.